Thank you very much for the invitation to talk here. And uh, so, how does it work? Yes. And uh, let me start with a few words about uh, Christophe. So, I understand that uh, Christophe door was always open, um, but I have to say that the door of the physics lab is always closed. So, <laughs> so when you're a mathematician, it's not always easy to, to meet physicists, but uh, what happened is that, uh, so I arrived about at the same time than Christophe at uh, the Ecole Normale. And uh, at that time, there were only two uh, teams in the math department, so it was PD and uh, geometry and one guy uh, doing probability. And so when I arrived, we were two probability people, and so it was decided that uh, we, sh uh, we should form a team. And so uh, this team was composed of so Julien Michel and I, and then uh, pieces, so percentage of many people, like very nice people like Cédric Villani, and Nalinia Notaraman, uh, Damien Gaborio, and so on and so forth. But uh, this is, uh, so this was really nice, but it was not always so easy to create activities, you know, like a working group and things like this. And uh, that this is when uh, Christophe arrived, because of course uh, we started to do working groups and uh, then Christophe was always uh, very interested, uh, very involved, uh, always ready to give talks. And uh, the main question uh, that we could ask when uh, uh, Christophe was around, was not if he would participate, but how long would be his talk. And uh, usually it was uh, very long and nice and uh, very uh, instructive, and uh, we really benefited from that. And I really think that, uh, so today I think we, we can say that there is a great relation between the uh, phys physics lab and the Department of Mathematics. And we have a lot of activities together, conferences and workshops and everything. And I really think that it's, uh, it benefited a lot of um, Christophe uh, being here. So I want to thank Christophe for this uh, invitation. Okay, so uh, let me uh, start to tell you a bit, if I can. No, it's stuck. Hmm. Ah, yes. So let me tell you a bit about uh, random matrices. So I have kind of a quick introduction about uh, uh, I mean, I, I like this topic, of course, I've been working on it for a long time now, and uh, uh, I think it's great for uh, a great uh, object in between uh, mathematics and physics, and so I want to give you a quick uh, introduction to this topic. So, uh, random matrices were really uh, born in uh, statistics, and it's uh, uh, in the work of Bichart to uh, try to understand how to analyze a large arrays of data. And the question that Bichart asked was, uh, how can you retrieve uh, the true information if you, have get that, if you get data with noise? And this is actually a very uh, active topic nowadays, in particular with machine learning and these kind of questions. Uh, then it went in physics in the work of Wigner, uh, who uh, proposed to uh, uh, approximate the Hamiltonian of heavy nucleus by a large random matrix. And uh, also in this kind of universality of the random matrix question, Montgomery proposed uh, to use them to model the zeros of Riemann zeta function. So this is on the critical axis, okay? So people know that there are uh, zeros on the uh, real axis, and then on the line, the vertical line, uh, at x equal one half, uh, you are supposed to have, so this is the Riemann hypothesis that you have all the non-trivial zeros. And so what is quite amazing today in mathematics is that this conjecture is not yet proven, but still it is used to prove uh, mathematical results on the uh, Riemann zeta function. And also today there are lots of places where uh, random matrix statistics appear, so in particular also in discrete uh, uh, questions like in the Lausanne styling or the six vertex models and so on. Uh, but so what I like uh, a lot is also this tip on different type of uh, work, which was uh, initiated in the work of Toft, and later in the work of Bresant, Paris, Sixington, and Zuber, uh, which related the uh, random matrices and uh, the enumeration of maps. So this is what I want to detail later, and in connection with some uh, uh, math topic, which is a free probability. So free probability is a, a theory of uh, probability for non-commutative variables, uh, which is equipped with the notion of freeness, which is very similar to independence. And what Voiculescu proved 
is that uh, random matrices as the size goes to infinity uh, will be asymptotically free. Okay, so this is what I will discuss, the connection between these two last results that I want to discuss in this talk. So the nicest, uh, maybe I mean the most famous uh, random matrix that people consider are the so-called uh, Gaussian ensembles. So you have a N by N matrix, which is a emission or symmetric, and which is filled with independent Gaussian entries above the diagonal. And uh, it's called the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble because, uh, or the Gaussian unitary ensemble because uh, it's invariant if you, the law is invariant if you conjugate it by uh, orthogonal or unitary uh, matrices. Okay. And uh, one of the most famous uh, results in random matrix theory is uh, the so-called Wigner theorem, uh, which tells you about uh, the eigenvalues of this matrix. Okay, so the eigenvalues are uh, real. And if you look at the number of eigenvalues which fall in a given interval as the size uh, of the matrix goes to infinity, so Wigner theorem asserts that it will converge to the semicircle law, so which means that here, so you have convergence of the expected number of eigenvalues in a given interval towards the measure of this interval under the semicircle law. And the connection with uh, the enumeration of graphs is already here by the fact that uh, the semicircle law, its moments, uh, are given by the Catalan's numbers, which counts uh, many things, uh, such as uh, the number of non-crossing pair partition of these two points, or the number of planar diagram of our vertex of 2P, 2P. Okay, and um, so I like to show the proof of this result because I think it's quite instructive to and quite, uh, still quite uh, important in the theory of random matrices. Uh, so first I will give this proof of uh, Wigner, which is uh, uh, based on the idea that even though uh, the law of the eigenvalues is quite complicated function of the entries, uh, if you want to understand the moments, uh, this function also nice uh, function of the entries because you can relate uh, the sum of the moments of the eigenvalues to the trace of your matrix. And then you see that if you want to understand the limiting distribution of the empirical measure, it's enough to uh, understand its moment just by density of the polynomials in the set of one continuous function. Hmm. Okay, and so this, uh, this is a nice function of the entries. And then if you want to uh, estimate that guy, uh, well, I imagine in physics it's kind of a piece of cake. Everybody does that uh, while sleeping. Uh, you just have a, a Gaussian moment to estimate, and for that you can use uh, Vig formula or Feynman diagrams. So how does it go if you look at this uh, moment? Well, you can represent uh, you run trees as the endpoint of some half edge of a vertex. So here you have the entry xi1, i2, xi2, i3, xi3, i4, and so on. And uh, you want to compute the expectation of uh, the corresponding moment. And to do that, so following the calculus, you will choose a pairing. Oops, yeah, okay. And uh, once you choose a pairing, you have a weight, which is the product of these covariances, which goes with it. And uh, because of the law, the joint law of the entries, you have uh, only uh, special pairings which will have a non-zero contribution. And if you look at it, uh, what it will impose is that if you follow the boundary of any phase of your diagram, uh, then uh, the indices will be constant. Okay, so that's, um, you can play with uh, taking another, uh, okay, it goes a bit fast, but uh, taking another pairing and you will see again that the indices stay constant over the boundary of the phase. So this shows that because the indices varies from one to n, so you have n choices for each index, that when you compute this moment, so this will be the sum of the possible graphs that you are doing here by these pairings, times n to the number of faces, times uh, for the weight of the covariance. And uh, when you use a Euler formula, you can rearrange its sum to get the sum of, uh, of the g non-negative of n to the minus 2g times some number, and uh, this number is the number of graphs that you can build by matching these half edges, 
so that at the end of the day, uh, your uh, uh, graph uh, is embedded in the surface of genus J. So that's uh, the connection, and then you can easily, uh, from there, because it's kind of finite sum, you can take the limit as n goes to infinity, and you see that only uh, planar diagrams uh, will remain. Okay, so that's a simple uh, proof, which still is very much used in random matrix theory because moments are sometimes the best ways to uh, compute this kind of statistics. Uh, however, there is ah, also, yes, so you can see that this is equivalent actually to non-crossing partitions. Uh, I want, however, to give another proof, oops, yes, uh, which uh, I will use later also, which is uh, inherited more from the approach by uh, Pastor and Marchenko. And this, um, this proof goes by uh, looking at uh, uh, stillness transform instead of moments. So that's also a nice uh, family of functions of uh, the eigenvalue, which is dense. And uh, the idea of uh, Marchenko and Pastor was uh, to use, to show that uh, asymptotically, when n goes to infinity, uh, this still does transform will satisfy some equation um, which has a unique solution and then again conclude that there is convergence of uh, uh, the spectrum. So how do you get such an equation? Uh, well, you can use uh, some type of uh, linear algebra first, so you take your uh, Still, your expectation of your still just transform. Do some algebra on you, like this, and you, I think you will all agree that uh, z times this guy minus one is going to be the trace of xn one over z minus xn. Okay, and then again you can uh, expand this by having first a linear term in your uh, Gaussian entries and perform an integration by parts. Okay, so this is done by integration by parts and. When you do that, so you realize that, so because under a Gaussian uh, law, the expectation of x times a function of x is just going to be given by the expectation of the derivative of this function, what you can see that you, what you get is a trace of the resolvent square. So you are nearly done, uh, because this looks a lot like the initial uh, quantity, except that the expectation is outside instead of inside. But again, you can think that this quantity is going to self-average, and this is indeed the case. And so what you see that you just get a quadratic equation for your still just transform. Okay, and uh, I want to advertise that because I think in many uh, uh, questions related to random matrices or this kind of strongly interacting particle system, the best way to approach the statistics is by getting this kind of equations, okay? And by doing integration by parts or uh, or Dyson Schrodinger equations. Actually, I wonder if this should be called zero mode either. Yeah. But okay, this will be kind of related because this kind of uh, integration by part is related with the fact that if you act with the infinitesimal generator over this type of uh, uh, observable, then you would just get zero. Okay, so in this case, what you get is a quadratic equation, and you can see that there is only one solution which will satisfy the right, uh, the right behavior at infinity. And so this gives you the convergence of Tn towards uh, the right solution to this uh, quadratic equation. Okay, so let me now go to uh, more complicated questions. So, and this was uh, in this work of Brezin, Dixon, Parisi, and Zuber. So what happens if you add a density? Okay, so you have again the Gaussian law, but now you add a density, which is a trace of a polynomial in your random matrices. So what they showed is that, uh, again, if you look at the partition function, or if you look at the uh, distribution of your uh, eigenvalues under this new law, so again, it will converge, uh, but this time the limit will be more sophisticated. It will be some converging series uh, in uh, the Ti, so the Ti are the parameters of your polynomial, times some numbers. And this number will be a number of planar maps that you build this time not on a single vertex, but on ki vertices of degree i uh, for one i between one and two r, so here it was two r, and here I forgot, but there should be also one vertex of degree p corresponding to this guy. Okay, and so the, uh, the approach uh, of uh, 
Brezai Tixon Parisian Zuber was to uh, use ex to expand everything and use this type of the calculus and Feynman diagram. And so what you get in fact is some uh, equality as formal series. Uh, in fact, it was shown later on that uh, provided everything makes sense, so the T of 2R is negative, so that this is kind of in finite integral, the GNT is finite. And uh, also if the TI are small enough, uh, then uh, this kind of, of limit is true at the asymptotic level, uh, provided so the, the TI are small enough. Okay, so it's not only a formal equality, it's also an equality, an asymptotic, a true asymptotic equality. And, and so, yeah, so this was proven by Young Bird on Mercolani and McLaughlin. And so this uh, type of collation was used in the paper already of uh, Brezin, Etixen, Parisi, and Zuber uh, to compute the enumeration of maps by just saying, well, uh, for random matrices, what we know is that we can diagonalize the matrix and uh, get a low and big value. So actually the Gaussian matrices or this type of matrices are the only one for which you get a, uh, an explicit joint law of the eigenvalues. And uh, what you see that you get uh, the density as you had before. And when you do the change of variable, you have also some uh, uh, Jacobian arriving, which is this Coulomb gas interaction. And then you can take the large n limit in this uh, guy and uh, what you can find by using uh, eventually large deviations or faketa points or, or many ways to do that, or subtle point method, you can get that this uh, free energy will be given by the supremum of all the probability measures, which represent the asymptotic of the empirical measure of your eigenvalues of some term coming from the interaction here, and plus uh, minus some term, uh, here there is a, oh, it's okay, here there is this sign, uh, plus some term coming from the interaction. And the main point here is that you can uh, compute uh, this, uh, this supremum and uh, find out uh, interesting properties for the generating function here, such as, for instance, the uh, uh, asymptotic behavior of the number of maps when k goes to infinity. Oops. All right. So that's a very nice story, and um, in fact, uh, it can be generalized. And uh, for instance, it can be, and this is what interests me, well, uh, it can be generalized when you consider several matrices, okay? Uh, because, um, uh, so if you now consider not one uh, random matrix, but let's say two, and uh, you consider polynomial in these uh, several independent random matrices, then you can use the same uh, approach to see that the trace of polynomial in these matrices is going to converge. I mean, you can use, again, Vic calculus, do exactly the same thing as before, as in this proof by Wigner, but here when you will uh, take the covariance between two matrices which are different, you will get a, a zero, uh, zero uh, term, and so what you see that what you are counting now is a colored partition or colored maps. So for instance, uh, if I look at the uh, polynomial which is x2 to the four, I will have uh, four points which will correspond to the first matrix, two points corresponding to the second one, two points and so on and so forth. And what this number will count is the number of non crossing per partition where you are allowed only to have a partition between dots of the same color. And this is coming again from the Vic, uh, Vic computation. Oops. Ah, yes, sorry. And so what uh, the, the, the arrival, so the connection with free probability is that this uh, distribution is very specific in free probability it takes somehow the, the role of uh, independent Gaussian variable in classical probability, uh, and it is a law of free variables. So let me tell you what is a, free, a bit free probability. I mean, uh, I, th I realize that now sometimes uh, people in physics start to be interested by free probability, so, so let me have two slides about that. So what is free probability? So in free probability, uh, probability measure are replaced by a threshold state. So what is a threshold state? It's a linear form on polynomials. 
uh, which satisfies some positivity conditions. So uh, here the function which are supposed to be non-negative will be the pro product of polynomial by their adjoint. Okay, so that's the notion of positivity. The, the, there is a notion of mass one, like for probability, the trace of one is equal to one. And also a notion of uh, trashality, which is very specific to the non commutative setup. And the main point I want to make is that um, if you take self-adjoint matrices, uh, then uh, the, the threshold state that you, well, the function that you get by taking the trace of polynomial in these matrices, so will be uh, such a, a non-commutative law. Okay, it's very easy to see that it will satisfy all these hypotheses. And also if you have a large end limit for this type of object, it will satisfy also all these uh, conditions. Okay, and so the notion of freeness uh, tells you uh, about a specific relation on this moment. So if you have, let's say, two variables, uh, we will say that uh, they are free if when you take mixed moments, it will be zero provided the trace of polynomial in X and the trace of polynomial in Y are zero. So this is a generalization of independence in some way because if you, have, if you had a commuting a variable, so you would take L equal to one, but you would say that the covariance is zero, which is exactly uh, the definition of independence for uh, one variable. And um, so you can see uh, several properties of this relation. So first, uh, you can uh, compute the trace of any polynomial in your two variables, x and y, provided you know the trace of polynomial in x and the trace of polynomial in y. So it defines only uniquely the joint law. Of course, you can uh, extend this definition to uh, free m free variables. Uh, but also, uh, the important thing is that it's connected with the usual notion of freeness in groups in the sense that if you would define the trace on a group, so if you had the two free generators and you would define a trace on the group or the L2 space of the group uh, as to be zero unless you have the neutral element, then you would see that this uh, property would exactly tell you that you cannot uh, create a non-trivial world in these two elements which will be equal to the neutral element. Okay, so this makes a connection with uh, the usual notion of freeness in groups. Okay, so, uh, so how can we go further? And the question now is what kind of uh, uh, other thing can we construct in free probability coming from, uh, from random matrices? And uh, it's a natural uh, question, I mean, to try to understand uh, what, what are the limits of random matrices uh, in this free world, and so, if we take, uh, as before, uh, some distribution which is uh, absolutely continuous with this, the, the, the law of independent Gaussian, but now you add some density, uh, then uh, what you can see that, again, by this approach of Brezin, and Parisi, and Zuber, uh, you expect that uh, the joint distribution under this kind of joint law will, converges, will converge towards some uh, generating function for planar maps. Okay, and this equality is given again uh, formally by, uh, by this approach by President Hickson, Parisi, and Zuber, which is really re relying on Wigner approach. And you can also get an asymptotic equality for this kind of thing, provided again that uh, the polynomial is going to minus infinity at infinity in some way, so that this is, uh, the partition function is finite, and also that the um, parameters are small enough. Okay, so that's a kind of uh, generalization, and then um, you can wonder about uh, how far can you extend this type of, uh, of uh, convergence. And, oh, sorry, I forgot, but yes, I, I first wanted to describe more about uh, this type of limits. So what uh, numbers are, are we uh, enumerating? Uh, so now, as I said, you should have uh, instead of vertices uh, of only one color, color, you should have vertices with several colors. So you, you can attach to a monomial uh, a vertex with a colored half edges by having a root. I'm saying that the, the root will have the color I1, the second will have color I2, and so on. So it's a vertex which is drawn on the surface. 
we have bijection, and then this number of maps which appear will be the number of maps that you can build over a certain number of vertices of type QI, uh, yeah, like this, on one vertex of type P. So that's kind of, uh, of the, the way you generalize a question to several matrices. And let me uh, give you uh, an example. So the example of, uh, so the well-known example of uh, the leading model on one-norm graphs. So here uh, you have one uh, potential with x1 to the 4, which corresponds to uh, vertices of degree 4, which are blue. Uh, you have uh, one uh, matrices x2 to the 4, which correspond to vertices of degree 4, which are red. And then one uh, interaction, which correspond to vertices which are blue and red. Okay. And then here you have an, an additional uh, polynomial, a monomial, which is uh, attached to uh, another uh, vertex. Uh, so here it's x2 to the square, uh, x1 to the square, x2 to the 4. Okay, and what you are counting is the number of planar diagrams that you can get by uh, matching uh, these half edges of the same color. All right, and, um, oops, ah, yes, and then the result, which goes back to Meta and the Bulatov and Kazakov, is that uh, by using this uh, uh, matrix integral, you can, as for the case with only one color, compute uh, the limit of this kind of matrix model. So in fact, for all parameters T1 and T2 which are negative, so that this makes sense, on all T3 in R, you can compute this limit. And this is quite remarkable, and this is why I wanted to make the point, that uh, for most matrix models, it's unknown how to compute them, okay? As soon as the interaction is more complicated than this one, uh, it's pretty difficult to compute uh, this type of matrix integral, and in fact, even to say that you have this kind of convergence. And this is what I have been trying to uh, understand um, um, late, more lately. So it's what kind of condition can you uh, give on your parameters of your polynomial to get convergence of the matrix model and eventually some information about the limit. Okay, so the first uh, generalization to general potential is that uh, you could expect that when you have a general matrix model, uh, if you have a potential which is convex, strictly convex, uh, this uh, you can get a convergence, okay? So that's the general idea in physics that if you have a, a convex interaction, you, you are not going to expect a phase transition compared to what happens in the Gaussian case. And this is more or less what was proved in a series of papers that so if you take a density, which is a trace of a polynomial, so that in any dimension, this will be a strictly convex function of the entries. Uh, then you can show that uh, the non-commutative law of your matrices under this uh, measure will converge. And somehow you can uh, imagine that this limit will be kind of the analytic extension of what you would get uh, if you would have uh, the, Gaussian, um, the Gaussian measure plus uh, some small polynomials in the monomials uh, arriving here. Okay, so that's one thing. Uh, but what about the properties of this kind of limit? And um, so what we proved, and this is more important at the level of uh, uh, free probability, is that um, we can build actually these measures as a nice push forward of the law of free variables, okay? So this means we can construct some type of analytic function, so it's not polynomial function in the matrices, but kind of converging series uh, of the matrices so that uh, tau v is uh, an image of the case where we have the Gaussian law. Okay, so that's uh, what we can do in this general setup. And let me give you uh, kind of the main uh, funny uh, uh, application of this result uh, which con concerns these uh, Q Gaussian variables. So what are Q Gaussian variables? So it's a, a non-commutative law, which is just given by the fact that if you uh, evaluate it at a monomial, xi1, xip, 
then what you will get is a sum of uh, the pair partition of Q to the number of crossings. Okay, so Q is in between uh, minus one and one. So when Q is equal to one, what you can see is that uh, what you will get is a sum of uh, all possible pair partitions. So what you get is uh, the law of Gaussian variables. Okay, so that's the calculus. Uh, and if Q equal to zero, what you see that you forbid all the crossings. Okay, so what you get is the law of free semicircular variables. And the question uh, that was asked by uh, Rosesco and Speicher is whether uh, this type of distribution, it looks more like a f the law of free semicircular variable or the law of uh, uh, Gaussian variables. So wh where is the transition between these two uh, laws? And uh, what we could uh, do by um, by using, uh, uh, what, what we could do is to use a result of Dabrowski, which shows that if Q is small enough, so here you are close to the semicircular, semicircular law, then Q is, this tau is a limit of matrix model, so you can compute some potential uh, so that you will get this kind of, uh, um, of limit. So it's kind of uh, contra contraintuitive because I try to argue all the time that the limit of uh, random matrices uh, is given by non-crossing pair partition, but in fact, you can also get crossings in this way. And uh, in fact, so this, this result was true only for Q small, but uh, Miyagawa and Speicher recently showed that it was true for all values of Q between minus one and one. And what we could use by using our free transport is that uh, in fact, uh, so when Q is small enough, the properties of this uh, distribution are very close to the one of uh, free semicircle law because we can build transport in between them. So in particular, the sister algebras and the, w, the Van der Man algebra associated to this uh, distribution are the same. So in the last few slides, I, I would like to tell you about some more recent work uh, where we try to understand uh, what happens in general? So, what can we what can we say beyond these uh, convex cases? And um, so, it's kind of a bit crazy because it's quite hard to say anything in general. But you know, we are mathematicians, so we just try. So, of course, we are not going to give very explicit result or very precise result in general. Uh, what we could uh, show is that so, if we have a potential uh, which is going to infinity fast enough, so it's something simple at the first. Uh, of highest degree, so the term of highest degree is pretty simple, plus something complicated, then what we can show is that the matrices will stay bonded. So this looks kind of uh, uh, pretty clear, but here we are in a situation where uh, we don't have any convexity of, of the trace, so we cannot use usual uh, tools like concentration of measure or basically bay inequality, so we had to invent some kind of new type of control to prove these kind of things. Uh, what we can prove also is that if we look uh, at the limit of the non-commutative law, the limit points, so we don't know if, we know because the matrices are bounded that the empirical distribution of the matrices is tight. I mean, they are going to give uh, bounded numbers. So we can take limit points and we can show that they satisfy the loop equations. So the very same uh, dyson schwinger equation that they were satisfying in the case where uh, you have small parameters, it will still be valid. So the problem is that in this case, at a kind of low temperature case, we know that there are, there are several solutions to these equations. So we cannot in general infer a convergence from this, uh, from this type of limit, but it's still uh, some information, okay? So for instance, what you can imagine is in the case where your potential is just a double well, so the loop equation will not tell you about the mass of each well. But it, it, once you are given the, the mass in each well, you can uh, deduce uniqueness of uh, the solution to the loop equations. So here we don't have convergence, but we still have uh, some type of information. Uh, so as I said, in pre a priori, there is no uniqueness of the solutions. And uh, there, there is, um, there were uh, a series now of two papers by Kazakov and Zheng uh, to try to uh, understand and give algorithms to uh, construct the solution of these uh, loop equations. And uh, they conjecture, but it's still a question that I'm 
not really clear to me how to, to state it in a general setup, but if you uh, know that there are additional symmetries uh, on the potential V, then you can get the uniqueness of, uh, of the solution of the loop equation. So for instance, if you have symmetry, you know that if you convert, it should be towards solution with a, the same mass in each well, something like this. Uh, and so, of course, when we can't say anything in the general case, we try to look at simpler, simple, uh, more specific cases, like everybody. And uh, so what could we say? So we look at the case where, uh, so the, we are in the low temperature setup. So in the low temperature setup, so you, have, you have a potential times a beta, which will be large now, plus some, uh, some term, which is uh, not multiplied by beta, which is just finite. And so you can see that if V has a unique uh, minimum, so typically it will be a constant time identities for all the matrices, uh, and which is not degenerate, then for beta small enough, somehow your measure will only see the neighborhood of this uh, minimizer and you will be back in convex type of situation that uh, you can analyze, okay? So somehow in this case, for beta large enough, you will be able to uh, study your matrix model. So what happens when you have more than one uh, minimizer, then it starts be, be, being much more complicated. Uh, and so the first thing we consider were the case where uh, the potential, which is big, so with this beta in front, uh, is just a sum of, uh, you know, somehow the idea that the case beta large should be easily to understand, and this is the case here where you have the sum of uh, potential which are only in one matrix. Uh, but this, um, uh, this potential are minimized in several places, okay? And uh, at, this, uh, at this point where it minimized, it behaves like some uh, x minus the minimum to, uh, to some power, okay? And so what we could show then is again we have a convergence, and also, yes, what is important is that the, the perturbation is going to vanish at this minimizer, so it really, in fact, is a, a perturbation of this term. And so what we could show then is that the, for beta large enough, uh, the empirical measure, so the joint, uh, the non-commutative distribution of our matrices will converge for beta large enough, and, and when beta goes to infinity, uh, so the, the limiting measure will concentrate at the minimizers of this potential uh, times some uh, mass, which is kind of what is the most complicated to understand here because again, it's not given by the loop equations. Uh, and this math uh, is depending on the power here that uh, you have, uh, the de degeneracy of the, um, of the potential at, the mini at the, its minimizer. So if you have non-degenerate minimizer, you, you just go to the uniform uh, measure at the, at the minimizers. And let me just tell you about the last case here that we consider, which is uh, so what uh, Kazakov called the unsolvable uh, model, commutator model. So what is that? So you, you have a ma uh, the potential is going to be given by some weight which depends on the commutator. So the sign is minus, but what you want to do is that when beta is very large, you want to have commutative variables. Okay, so this should go to zero when beta is very large. And then you add two potentials on each matrices. And so this, uh, this matrix model can easily be uh, uh, solved if you have one of the potential which is just quadratic, because then what you get in one matrix, we have something quadratic. So you can integrate it out, it's just a Gaussian integral, and then you will be with only one matrix integral. One matrix integral we know how to solve, okay? So that's uh, easily understood, I mean, easily computable, but uh, if uh, V1 and V2 are not quadratic, it's uh, much more complicated. And um, so what we could get so far is, um, is very partial. We can only show the limit when N goes to infinity and then beta goes to infinity of the non-commutative distribution. And what we could see that it, uh, it converges towards the minimizer of the potential. So even though there is no beta in front of uh, of this potential, it converges towards uh, the minimizer of these guys, and the weight uh, of uh, the mass of the, of the direct measure at this minimizer depends now, so we assume they're all non-degenerate, and it depends on the 
second derivative somehow of the potential uh, at this point. So again, uh, so I understand that the conjecture is that if uh, the VI are, are even, then uh, there should be always convergence of this matrix model. Uh, yes. Okay, so now let me uh, kind of conclude. Uh, so what I try to show you is that uh, for several matrix models, there are still uh, a lot of things to, to understand, in particular, so we don't understand the low temperature expansion for most models, so not to say phase transition. Uh, I would be very interested to know only that uh, this converges, because uh, in free probability, this would help to construct a good uh, uh, theory for uh, free entropy. Um, this type of result I presented you could be uh, improved to get uh, not only uh, the convergence but also the fluctuation on actually what we call the topological expansion. So mainly if you look, you look uh, at Wigner's um, proof that I gave you, it was not only the limit of the matrix model that I, I showed you, but you could get a full one over N expansion. And this is also true um, uh, for matrix model with a, a non-trivial density, and this, there were a lot of work around that by Bertrand and R, for instance. And you can use uh, loop equations and Dyson Schrodinger equation to prove rigorously that you have this type of asymptotic expansion. And in fact, uh, this type of, uh, of use of loop expansion goes much beyond uh, matrix models. Uh, at least you can uh, generalize this to uh, unitary or orthogonal groups. I mean, the integration by parts will be replaced by word identities, and the fact that your measure is invariant by uh, multiplication by unitary or orthogonal uh, matrices. Uh, you can also replace, uh, so if you look at one matrix model, you can replace the Coulomb interaction uh, by a more uh, sophisticated interactions. So this is what we did with Carol and uh, Gaetan Borreau. Uh, so if you want to get uh, expansion of the free energy of the Sinch model, well, uh, the, what we did was to derive a loop equations or dyson schrodinger equation and solve them uh, inductively. Um, you can also generalize this type of thing to a discrete setting. So this is kind of more surprising. Uh, because doing integration by parts in discrete settings is uh, always more uh, uh, more difficult. Uh, but uh, then we were uh, helped by the another kind of equations, which were introduced by uh, Nekrasov uh, and uh, interpreted by uh, Alexei Borodin um, for us. And so we had some work on uh, uh, doing uh, flu studying fluctuation on large n expansion in Lausanne stylings based on these equations. And uh, you can also generalize this type of approach to uh, loop models and uh, uh, POTS model, and this uh, applies also to subfactor uh, theory. And I think I am done. What is free entropy on your last slide? Uh, okay, so free entropy, um, there were several uh, definitions, but the idea is to, to, to define a, an entropy in, a, in free probability. And for that, the first definition that Voiculescu gave was to try to measure the volume of matrices whose non-commutative distribution would approximate a given uh, threshold state. Okay, so you can think about the uh, usual entropy, like you know the integral of log f, f dx, as the volume of uh, uh, particles uh, which approximate a given uh, uh, probability measure. And so that was a kind of uh, generalization to the uh, non-commutative setup. And then Voiculescu introduced other definitions, so which are based for more on a, a um, how is it called? Fisher information. And, uh, and th then the question was, you know, whether these two are equal or, or what? But uh, at the time being, we have only inequalities, and we don't even know that the free entropy, so this volume is going to converge. Okay, so if you look at the volume and you take uh, 
of, uh, of uh, so the ball around a given uh, uh, non-commutative measure, uh, and you take the large end limit of this, uh, of this ball, uh, can you take the limit? So for the time being, there are only limb sweep or limb inf. And this is exactly related with, uh, oop, ah, no way to go back. Okay, too late. Yeah, okay. Okay, so this is related with, so if you could prove somehow that the uh, matrix models, they converge, this would uh, be a way to, to try to prove the convergence of the free entropy. Yeah. Hi, um, yeah, I was wondering if people have considered introducing in free probability matrix models, a notion of um, like time evolution automorphism groups and like instead of traceability, like kubo martin sugar relation, like is done in statistical mechanics, the CETA algebra formulation of StatMec. Uh, we, we have uh, evolution like Brownian motion. We have mm -hmm. free Brownian motion. Yeah. Uh, we have Poisson distribution. We have quite a lot of things. I mean, that's, that's kind of the idea of free probability that you can uh, generalize many objects from a classical probability to this non-commutative setup and hopefully you get some uh, result from there. So I try to advocate this uh, uh, isomorphisms of uh, CETA algebra of the q Gaussians as one example, but uh, yeah. there are quite a few examples where this type of approach was useful. D does it connect with the results people have obtained like in the 70s, 80s about uh, quantum statistical mechanics, you know, using, using CETA algebra, people have um, that kind of result for equilibrium states and all that? Uh, uh, the point of view of uh, quantum uh, mechanics is a bit different because you have this density. Uh, and so I think it's, uh, it, for me, it, lo it looks a bit different uh, approach. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I, actually I wrote it, but of course it's super universal. I mean, you only need to have independent entries which are centered and with a covariance one over n. So if they are not IID, you, may, you need some uh, uniform integrability, but uh, uh, yes, that, that, this is very uh, general. But uh, if you want to, um, to get results uh, with matrix model, uh, and you don't start with Gaussian or something which is a uh, nicely behaving with respect to Lebesgue measure, I think there is just nothing. So, I mean, if you start making some, uh, the, the, there are very few results about uh, random matrices with dependent entries, which are not starting from the Gaussian, where, where you don't have some kind of symmetric group acting on it. 